from Cassowary Coast to the May 16th CCIN's weekly segment. My first topic for you this week is how Tully get, got to met, take centre stage for World Rafting Championships. The town of Tully was vibrant with the arrival of athletes for the long-awaited Tame the Tully World Rafting Championships that officially started on Thursday, May 16th. In the days before the event, as well as finally getting out on the famous Grade 4 Rapids for practice runs, athletes from all corners of the world were keen to mingle with locals and adjust their bodies to the time zone and the famous Australian tropical climate. The Tully District and Chamber of Commerce has its fingerprints all over the events this week having done a yeoman's work in the months leading up to it to make sure it was a success. Every local resident has to be proud of the work that they have done to show off the region as a world-class destination. The athletes met on the street and it was a great place to stay. They loved being able to meet their fellow competitors from other countries, some of whom they hadn't seen since the last rafting competition. In between the official events, the visitors took to the streets of Tully to sample the local cuisine or visit the stores in the area. IGA seemed to be a very popular spot, with many of the amateur athletes trying to stretch their food dollars. Monday, May 13th, the Chamber of Commerce organised a meet and greet at the Ripe Harvest Cafe on Butler Street, where locals had the chance to meet with athletes and coaches. On Tuesday, a crowd of thousands turned up for the parade marking the official opening of the World Rafting Championships. It started at Mitchell Park and ran along Bryant Street and down Butler Street toward the Tully Showgrounds, where the official World Rafting Championships opening ceremony took place. The high point of the proceedings so far was definitely the parade and opening ceremony. Close to a thousand people took part in the parade itself, and at least the same amount lined Bryant and Butler streets all the way down to the showgrounds, where Tully's rains pummeled all who dared to come out, as if to say, welcome to the wettest place in Australia. The region is officially on notice. It's time to tame the Tully. What do you think of Tully? Oh, because you touched the dirty. What do you think of Tully the town? Beautiful. Yeah. The person, family. Yeah? Oh, good. You feel welcome? Oh, that's good. Good. It's a, it's a, it's a friendly place. I'm, I'm, I'm very new to the town. And I got here seven weeks ago and you can talk to anybody in the town, you know. Yes. Just go up to them and say hi, and they'll talk to you. <laughs> so you think you're going to win? Oh, we think, but <laughs> just tomorrow to have a conquest. Yeah. Yeah. But well, good. I don't know. But well, good luck. Oh, thank Wish you. you luck.
My second topic for you is that Cabo residents held a huge rally demanding the dredging of Hinchinbrook Harbour. The message was simple, we vote, we vote. More than 30 boat owners turned out to the protests in inaction from the government at all levels on the problems at Hinchinbrook Harbour. Harbour. David Swain, representing Cardwell Sport Fishing Club, spoke out on behalf of the members and called for the government to allocate $1.5 million to the efforts to dredge One Mile Creek. Councillor Glenn Raleigh joined in and spoke with outrage at the avoidance of the responsibility by all three levels of government. Anne-Marie Goggy, Cardwell Coast Guard Flotilla Commander, also spoke passionately about the danger to life due to the blockage that restricts the access of Coast Guard boats. In the other corner was a small group led by well-known activist Ken Parker. They were concerned that once One Mile Creek is dredged, the large number of boats that will have access will kill the local Dugong population. As a man with his fingers in a few boating pies, Swain had much motivation. We're here today due to the fact that the dredging of One Mile Creek has not been done. We have recently found out that the state government owns One Mile Creek. It is their property. This is tourism for Cardwell, which has been in the lulls now for well over 10 years. We've had businesses close and a lot of jobs lost for the community. We're asking the government to cough up the 1.5 million it will cost to dredge, said Swain. For a comparison's sake, recently the Queensland government set aside 5 million for a dredging project that will deliver all tide access at Mollongol Creek's boat ramp in Bowen. Swain now wants the government to assign the smaller amount to One Mile Creek. We want the state government to come to the party and cough up the 1.5 million. It has put lives at risk and we're very lucky that no one has lost their lives when the Coast Guard couldn't get out. Time is running out and our luck is running out. Someone is going to get killed and when that happens all fingers are going to point the blame at all levels of government, said Raleigh. This was echoed by Goggy. Last December, five people had to be res rescued by the Coast Guard near Hinchinbrook Island. But the Coast Guard was unable to leave the port until high tide, came in three hours later. In that case, they were lucky that no one required urgent medical attention. More recent events suggest that the Coast Guard vessels may be unavailable for even routine situations. Our rescue boats went out on Tuesday at 12.20 in the afternoon, headed out to Bryn Mawr Reef to tow a vessel. They did not get home until 10 o'clock that night because we had no damn water to get the boat back in, said Goggy. The government is claiming that the land is privately owned and refusing to take responsibility, but Swain claims that they have proof that the property is government owned. One of the documents CCIN has seen is a letter written by Andrew Cripps when he was a member for Hinchinbrook that stated, The perimeter of the marina and a large portion of the Grand Canal have been identified as being public assets under the Coastal Protection and Management Act. Cripps goes on to suggest that the Cassaray Coast Regional Council should have access to Natural Disaster Relief and Recovery Arrangements, NDRRA, funding from the Australian Government. More than 30 boats were towed along Bruce Highway to demonstrate the government neglecting One Mile Creek. At the same time, the group of four counter-protesters held up signs demanding that we protect the dugong in the, war in the area. Parker, a Kabul resident and veteran protester, said while he had no problem with the dredging itself, it should be paid for, the for by the boat owners, not rate payers. His other concern is that an increase in boats in the water will kill the dugong, but conservatives and marine biologists feel that this concern is unwarranted for boats this size. Done. My third topic for you this week is how the seniors of the Cardwell community have been neglected by Cassaray Coast Regional Council. Seniors in Cardwell are outraged that their local pool, built in the 1980s, has been neglected by the Cassaray Coast Regional Council, CCRC, despite having 250,000 earmarked for repairs more than 10 months ago. Spokeswoman for Friends of the Pool, Sue Metcalf, is a retired school principal from New South Wales and has lived in Cardwell for five years, devoting her time to helping seniors, especially those who visit the pool to stay fit and recover from medical procedures. For months now, Metcalf has been asking for a meeting with several members of the CCRC in order to firm up a date for necessary upgrades to the pool with no success. I have been asking for a meeting with Mr Goodman, the Mayor, Councillor Rally, the Pool Manager Mark Sheehan and a group of pool users since early March, said Metcalf. The letters and emails of the Friends of the Pool have received back are littered with words like whilst, however, notwithstanding, such phrases like actively working towards, being considered, time frames currently being prepared, under construction, under consideration, to be delivered, identified a need for, and as soon as possible. The only thing resembling an action date refers to June 2021, more than two years away. To Metcalf, it all sounds like the government double speak indicative of no set plans. 
The repairs that Friends of the Pool consider urgent are ones regarding the safety and dignity of their older citizens. All except two of our members are over 60, with most in their 70s and even some in their 80s. As well as the aged, there are people recovering from knee, hip replacements and other injuries who are there for rehabilitation provided by a visiting physio, said Metcalf. The steps into the pool have one handrail which doesn't reach right over the top step. To assist many patrons, a second handrail would be a big help. Ideally, a ramp into the pool would be provided. There are also severe privacy issues. The pool is shared with families, said Metcalf. The other day I was showering when a mother walked in with her seven-year-old boy. Many older people want some privacy and a bit of dignity. At the same time, I understand mums swimming with their boys or men swimming with their girls don't want to send their children alone into a changing room. She feels this is an embarrassment that could easily be avoided by having family changing rooms, something that is a common in public swimming areas these days. In a letter to one of the friends of the pool, David Goodman, Director of Infrastructure Services, said the council had identified a number of highly higher priority works at the Cargo Pool, seemingly suggesting that the request to repairs and enhancements that the elderly and infirm. Metcalf wants to know what happened to the money allocated for the pool. Council approved a budget of 250000 for the upgrade of Cargo Pool on June 26, 2018, yet nothing has been done. We have been unable to find out what happened to the money that was in the budget, as Council refuses repeatedly to answer this question. Councillor Rally acknowledged that there are allocations in this year's budget. When asked what the holdup was, he said, money. CCRC responded to our request for comment by saying that the 239000 will have been spent by the time the pool reopens after the winter break. A representative for the CCRC said, various works are scheduled, including installation of automated pool chemistry sampling and dosing, including remote monitoring facility. Metcalf's final comment on the matter, these are not the things we are asking for, but we will fight on. to you about our daughter Cassandra. Cassandra was um, a 23 year old young adventurer um, who passed away in Nepal last year on the 29th of November. She died kayaking doing what she loved in, in Nepal surrounded by beautiful people that she loved um, in a community that she loved and a place that she called home. She was really really passionate about adventure sports so Cassandra had a journal that um, she we found after she passed and in that journal she was very specific about what she wanted to do and our main thing that we've got from that journal is that she really wanted to make a difference. She was passionate, really passionate about women in adventure sports. So we've created this legacy for her. We've started up what's called the Kasanga Fund. We'd love for you to jump on board and help support us. Our slogan for our campaign is please give a dollar to help raise a million. We'd love for you to get onto our Facebook page, like and share it, get it around the whole world. Our mission for the Kasanga Fund is to support and promote women in adventure sports. We want to raise a million dollars. We really want to create two adventure schools, sister schools, for women to come, to come and experience adventure sports, get some skills, get some self-confidence, and get out there and learn how to be really in community with the men. Uh, we're all about equality and getting women acknowledged and recognised for their contribution in the sporting world. So please get on board and help us.
name is Michelle Weir. Um, I've been doing this jewellery here now, I've seen jewellery for about 19 years as a hobby. Um, I go now and again to the markets and um, yeah, I also do, I'm also an abstract artist. Um, huh. What else do I do? Arts and crafts. Anything that comes into mind that I can put together, I do it. Hey, these are the red sandalwood seeds? The red sandalwood seeds. They're all red sandalwood seeds, yes. huh? Yes. Okay. Oh no, there's mixtures. Oh, that's it. They're all different yeah, they're different well. colors. And that's their natural color? That's their natural color, yeah. Wow. Beautiful. If you get a yellowy color, it, didn't, it means it didn't mature to yeah. this red stage, but it's the same seed, yeah. All right. oh, my jewelry? Yeah. And it's all about the colors and the as well. We have a plan to get the word out about what plants are out there to actually rebuild the rainforest. You just can't plant any plants, so yeah. Um, we Currently we have black bean seeds there that can be planted into those tubes. Yeah. We take it then back to our nursery and then we grow them there and then they go out to revegetation sites. Um, anywhere within the Gurigan region, so Gurigan covers um, kilometers from south to Rolling Stone to Mission Beach to the north right. and at the back to um, Ravens Road then down to Greenvale, all those countries. Wow. They did, they did have that to go out to plant a million trees and um, I think they have come halfway with it and yeah. Wow. So, yeah. They, or they just donate and then you plant They them. donate a gold coin to okay. the cause. And then if they do wish to take it, they can take it, so okay. yeah. But otherwise you plant it for them? Other, otherwise we'll plant it and then they can follow up on our Facebook page, yeah. our Girigan Aboriginal Nursery Facebook page, and then they can see the stages of the growth of that tree right up to when it goes out to rebeach. Excellent. Okay, good. Okay, well that's...